My favorite film this week is from 1974. It's called The Taking of Pelham 123. It's directed by Joseph Sargent, and it's about a heist. It would be tempting to deprecate it as a minor movie, but that would be begging the question. Must a great film concern itself with the great questions of life? I don't think so. To my mind, a great film is one that transfigures its subject, one that fully exploits the potential of its medium. The taking of Pelham 123 fully meets these qualifications. It is, in fact, a perfect film. I have seen it a few dozen times, and everything about it continues to ring true. It features outstanding direction from Sargent, a witty script by Peter Stone, a propulsive and unusual score by David Shire, an art direction by Gene Rudolph and cinematography by Owen Roisman that puts you in the middle of the action and keeps you there for 90 minutes. And the cast is a dream. Pelham begins in media res. This is such a powerful device that I'm continually surprised it is not employed more often. There is so much this film has to teach filmmakers. For instance, how to impart rather a lot of exposition without either slowing the narrative or making it seem like a lecture. Here's another trick. It's not necessary to impart what is these days tiresomely called backstory to every character, or even any character. It is sufficient to assume that people do not appreciate being kidnapped, threatened with guns, or being trapped in a driverless vehicle hurtling 100 miles an hour. Pelham's plot is simple and ingenious. Four men, three heavies and a specialist, a disgruntled and peevish Martin Balsam, take control of a New York City subway car and its 18 passengers and demand a ransom of $1 million in unmarked hundreds and fifties to be delivered in one hour. When Lieutenant Garber, Walter Matthau, the transit cop negotiating with head hijacker Mr. Blue, Robert Shaw, complains that this is not physically possible, Blue replies, you'd be surprised what's physically possible. And we are. Blue is not a genius and he's not a madman. He just wants his one quarter of a million. Lieutenant Garber is not a genius either. And he's not tormented by a dead wife or child or a terrible misdeed from the past or your cliché here. He's just doing his job. And I like movies that respect work. A lesser film would strain to establish a cat-and-mouse relationship between Blue and Garber. Pelham is smarter than that. Blue is not interested in tormenting Garber because time is money, literally in this case. And Garber is not interested in understanding Blue. He just wants to save 18 lives. Garber's co-workers, the mayor and the city administration, are not as stalwart. As Frank Correll, Dick O'Neill, tells Garber, Christ, to hear you plead with that chicken shit makes me ashamed to be an American. And then, getting to the heart of the matter, Screw the goddamn passengers. What the hell did they expect for their lousy 35 cents? To live forever? This is a very sweary movie, but one hardly notices it, as the profanities are both earned and fully committed. As Kaz Dolowitz, Tom Petty, another of Pelham's hilariously furious ethnics, exclaims, if I got to watch my language just because they let a few broads in, I'm going to quit. How the hell can you run a goddamn railroad without swearing? Quite so. This is how you do it, filmmakers. And here's another tip. Watch carefully the scene involving Garber and the Japanese visitors. You'll notice, if you're going to do the man gets caught out displaying gross racial insensitivity gag, it is not necessary for the whole world to learn of his transgression. It is necessary only for him to understand that he's been suckered. Pelham captures a particular moment in New York history. Those who have seen the Coen brothers inside Lou and Davis will remember the two scenes where our eponymous hero takes a cat onto the subway. The 1961 reaction from the bourgeois passengers is bemusement, even outrage. A cat on a subway? Now I've seen everything. Thirteen years later, the Cohen's passengers would be grateful for a cat. It would make a nice change from the squalor, from the complete collapse of standards that 1974 would bring. But such is the identification that Pelham makes with filthy, broke, profane, and sinful New York City that we find ourselves rooting for it 
and its ugly, fractious, sweary people. The taking of Pelham 123 is a testament to the power of casting and the power of realism. Every shot, every action, every motivation, and every face is real. It's the kind of movie that couldn't be made today. Mathau and Shaw were stars, but they weren't chewing the scenery. Certainly not like Denzel Washington and John Travolta in the deplorable remake. And here's the final tip that filmmakers can take from this film. Cast every role with the best actors you can find. Besides the names I've already mentioned, Pelham has fine performances from Hector Elizondo, Kenneth McMillan, Doris Roberts, Lee Wallace, and Jerry Stiller. Pelham is available in a bare-bones Blu-ray from 20th Century Fox. On the one hand, there are no extras. On the other, you get a first-rate transfer of a great film for about 15 bucks.